today we're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 6. And um, this, once again, is a, uh, an aspect of the retelling um, that is happening before the children of Israel go into the promised land. Uh, they've come out of Egypt. They've gone through the wilderness. They had the purging of the original generation. And now this new, younger generation that had reached that uh, another uh, age of adulthood are, are ready to go in. And uh, Moses is now giving them a rehash or a retelling of the things to encourage them and to give them some stability uh, on their thinking and in their mindset when they get into the land. Now, before we get into uh, chapter 6, one of the things that we're going to see here is once again, this aspect that these scriptures are talking about Jesus. And I want to uh, just make sure that we kind of bring that out um, a little bit more so that we understand that this is something that we need to make sure we pay attention to. Now, if you, if you kind of remember, and sometimes I don't really emphasize it or not a lot, but like even on our, our YouTube channel, our name on YouTube, on YouTube is Emmaus. And the reason why we, we choose that name is because it was on the Emmaus Road when Jesus was walking with those two travelers. And they were going down the Emmaus Road and they were concerned and worried because Jesus had, had died and he had been buried and they could not find his body. They went to the sepulcher and he was gone and they were all concerned. And Jesus walked with them unawares. They didn't know it, but while they were concerned and worried, Jesus was right there with them. And then he made a statement to them as they began to worry and complain and tell Jesus, who they thought was just another ordinary guy, um, all of their, 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 their heartbroken and heart, uh, uh, you know, ways of feeling sad. And Jesus said a couple of things to them. So I want to turn to what Jesus said to them as they uh, began to walk down this road. So we want to go to uh, Luke chapter 24. And we're going to take a look at something here before we get into Deuteronomy 6. We want to go to Luke chapter 24. And um, I just want to reiterate a few things here so that we know that when we're looking at these Old Testaments, we are looking at Jesus. All right. So in Luke chapter 24, we're going to look at verse 25. And one way to remember this is it's like, you know, 24 to 24 hours in a day, all day long, this, this is true. So you go to Luke chapter 24, and it says, um, uh, let's see here. It said, and certain of them which were with us went uh, to the sepulcher and found it even uh, so as the women had said. But him they saw not. Now, they, this is their ending of them telling the story that, you know, we couldn't even find where Jesus was. He wasn't even in the sepulcher. Look at 25. Then he said unto them, the, the he is who? Jesus. O fools and slow of heart. He called them fools because fools, uh, the Bible says, a, a fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And he called them fools because they're looking at things as though there is no God. God has never and will not ever lose control. So you're worrying when you worry and concerned about, well, what's going to happen? What's going to, you start acting foolish from God's perspective because you don't uh, seem to put God in the equation. You've removed God and just added your concern and your worries about what you can do. So Jesus called, he said, oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all the prophets to, be, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. So he says, you're not believing what the prophets have spoken. And look what he goes on to say. Look at 26. And here's the, the kicker. Ought not uh, Christ have uh, suffered these things and to endure unto his glory? Into. Uh, into his glory. So he suffered, but then entered into his glory. And here's the, the last verse that we'll read here. And it says, 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures. How many of the scriptures? All the scriptures. The things concerning 
himself. So what he's saying is, if you had understood that all the scriptures, which ones, beginning at Moses, and all the prophets, everything that we read in the Old Testament, is concerning Jesus. So when I'm going through the Old Testament, and I'm always looking how we can apply Jesus to this, and how this is a, a type, or a metaphor, or an allegory, or some kind of, of, of shadow of Jesus, this is one of the reasons why I'm doing that. Well, the scripture does say that everything be established by what? Two or three witnesses. So let's get another witness to this. And uh, let's go to John chapter 5. <clears throat> so you just move over one book. Go to John chapter 5. And we're going to go to, we're going to start at, at verse 38. John 5. Verse 38. Now, this is Jesus talking to the Pharisees. Okay? All right. So, he's talking to the Pharisees. And, um, actually, you know, let me, let me, uh, I saved 38. Let's go up to uh, 37. And it says, And the Father himself which hath sent me, who sent Jesus? The Father, this is Jesus speaking, have borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. So he says, you don't know the Father like he knows the Father. Look what he says, 20, uh, 38. And ye uh, have not uh, his word abiding in you. He's talking to the Pharisees. You don't have God's word. Which word is he speaking about? The, the Old Testament. But they read the Old Testament all the time. But they're reading it as what? As just a book or as something to use to, to have control. Not as something to seek and to get connection to God. But he's going to explain it. Let me just, I'm, I'm explaining that, but Jesus himself is going to explain it in just a moment. For whom he hath sent, uh, him ye believe not. For the one that God has sent, and God sent himself in the form of his son, Jesus, you don't believe him. Look at 39. And then he said, search the scriptures. For in them... Ye think ye have eternal life. So he says, search the scriptures. Because you think in scripture you have eternal life. And you're not 100% wrong. But look what he says here. And these are they which testify of me. So he's saying, these scriptures testify of me. And then you say, well, does that mean that if we seek him, we get eternal life? Well, let's look at the very next verse. Look at verse 40. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. So if you, he said, if you don't come to me, you will not have life. Well, what is the inverse of that? If you come to me, you will have life. All right. Um, and there's a few other scriptures that we could look at. Um, uh, I, I guess we might as well. Uh, let's look at uh, John 6. So since we're here already, let's look at John 6. And we're going to go to verse uh, 28. And it says, then, they, then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? And this is their, their question to God. These are the people after Jesus had fed the 5,000. And Jesus said, Y'all not coming after me because you love God. You're coming after me because your bellies were filled. And he said, you, You're not doing it properly. And then they asked him the question, What shall we do? that we might have eternal life. Jesus gave them the answer in verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God. You want to know what to do? This is it. That ye believe on him whom he hath sent. All right, so that's the whole aspect. You have to believe on him who he hath sent. Now, one of the reasons why I wanted to get this in is because this chapter in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6, is going to talk about uh, Jesus Christ all up and down. We're going to see him in, in all of this, especially in that very last verse. So without any further delay, let's go ahead and get this reading in, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let's take a listen. Chapter 6. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments 
which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I commanded thee, thou and thy son, and thy son's sons, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto the children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sight upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house, and on thy gates. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities, which thou buildest not, and houses full of all the good things, which thou fillest not, and wells digged, which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees, which thou plantedest not. When thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, and serve him, and shalt swear by his name. Ye shall not go after other gods, of the gods of the people which are around about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee, and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God, as ye tempted him in Massa. Ye shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, and his testimonies, and his statutes, which he hath commanded thee. And thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest go in and possess the good land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, to cast out all thine enemies from before thee, as the Lord hath spoken. And when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What mean the testimonies and statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded you? Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord shewed signs and wonders great and sore upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from thence, that he might bring us in, to give us the land which he sware unto our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness, if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he hath commanded us. All right. This is such a beautiful portion of scripture, especially when you are applying this to Jesus Christ. Now, what I want to start with, I'm going to start with the very last verse in this chapter. Because this is the verse that, um, if you look at it, it helps us to understand the, the, the importance of how we are brought to God connecting to some of the scriptures that we read before we got to here, talking about how Jesus is the fulfillment of all of this. Look at this 25th verse. It says, and it shall be our righteousness. Okay, what is the it and it? What's, well, what's the it? The it means all the stuff that, that we just talked about, that Moses just uh, uh, rattled off, which we're going to go over in just a moment. But all that stuff that Moses is talking about, all that stuff is going to be our righteousness. But it's a, there's another word after that. If, and that's an important uh, two-letter word, if. If we observe 
to do all these commandments. Not some, not most, not the majority, but all. So if you do all of these commandments, what do you get? You get righteousness. If we do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he had commanded. So if you want to be righteous, you got to do all that we're talking about here in this chapter. Now, right off the bat, let me just say, as we review this, I'm going to tell you that I have not done all these things. And I'm going to take a guess. It's a wild guess, but I'm going to guess that you have not done all these things. Okay? So, then, how do we get the righteousness? Well, we go back to those preliminary scriptures that we read. The righteousness comes from who? From Jesus. That's why when the people that were fed the, the loaves, the 5,000 people said, what shall we do? How, you know, what are the works of the Lord? And he said, this is the work that you should do, that you believe on him whom he has sent. All right? And he told the workers, the, 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 the walkers on uh, the Emmaus Road, why are you all upset? And they're upset because things are not working the way they want to. Just like things don't work the way we want to in our lives. But Jesus let them know, oh, you slow of heart, you fools and slow of heart. Should not these things happen? Don't we, aren't we supposed to go through troubles and trials and, and, and tribulations here on earth? We're supposed to have that because we're walking in the ways of Christ. But the righteousness aspect of it is given to us. It's a gift. It's God's gift. His grace and mercy and his love that he gives unto us. Therefore, all this stuff that we're reading through, through all the Genesis, all the books of Moses. Remember when he said that uh, in, in the Amazus, Amazus Road, he began at Moses and all the prophets speaking on things concerning himself. This is the beauty of walking, knowing that you have committed your heart, mind, soul to Jesus Christ and accepted him as your propitiation, as your substitute I can't do it myself. I need somebody else to, to, to do it for me. Jesus said, I've done it. So now when we go back to the beginning of this chapter and we read all this stuff and we're going to see and we know as we go further along the scripture that Israel is not going to do this stuff. Well, it's no surprise to God. You know, me and my wife were talking earlier today and I, we were talking about the whole aspect of you know, God, God is not going to be surprised that, that Israel fails, he, but he has to tell them. And why is he telling them? He's telling them because in, from God's perspective, God already knows what's going to happen. He's already know, he already knows uh, what they chose, what they did, and what they said, and what they followed. And somebody says, well, why do we got to then live through it? If God already knows it, why don't he just, you know, uh, 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 present the sentence and let us well, the reason why we have to still live through it is not so we can make the choice because from God's perspective, we already made the choice. What we need to know is why we made the choice. See, you've already, in your heart, you've already done this from, from what God is looking. God already sees your end. He knows the what? The beginning from the end. God already knows what you're going to do. He's already seen your choice. But you now have to discover why you chose that. Why did you do this? And that's what life is going to do for us. Help us to understand, why did I end up with this eternal destiny? If people are lost, they're going to understand why they're lost. If people are saved, they're going to understand why they're saved. We've already, from God's perspective, made the decision. That's why there's nothing new under the sun. From God's perspective, we've already done this. Now, what we're going to do here is look at this chapter and we're going to see all the things that we need to do that we can't completely do. We can do some of it, but we can't do all of it. But Jesus did everything that we're about to mention here. And everything that we look at here, you're going to recognize, well, I didn't do that completely, but Jesus did. Oh, I do some of that, but Jesus did all of it. Oh, I don't really do this at all very well, but Jesus do it does it perfectly. And that's what we're going to see here. And it helps us to just have the confidence about the word of God, that it speaks about the son of God, how he stripped himself, came down, 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believeth in him might have eternal life. Right? And we know that the scripture also says that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus Christ. All right, let's get into the, the reading here. So it says here in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Now, these are the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God command you I'm sorry, commanded uh, to teach you that ye may do them in the land whither you go to possess it. So here's all the what? Here's, here's all the commandments, statutes, judgments that you, that you were commanded to teach so that you can continually possess the land. So there are things that have to be done. There are, uh, are thinking and ways and, and, and uh, behaviors that have to happen when we come into the land. Let's keep going. Uh, verse 2. That ye mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, that uh, uh, thou and thy son and thy son's sons all the days of thy life, that thy days may be prolonged. So, once again, uh, commandments, statutes, um, learn to fear, learn to keep. And another thing he said, teach. Well, when you think about Jesus, what, is he, what was one of the, the names that was called him? He was called the what? Great teacher. The great teacher. So Jesus did that. He kept all the commandments. He kept all the statutes. He did all the judgments, but he also taught. He was the great teacher. No one speak like this man, you know, the, the, the people of his day said. He teaches as though he, uh, he is one that has what? Authority. And then he lets us know, if you want to come to God, if we told those 5,000, you want to come to God? You better believe on him whom he sent, which was who? Jesus Christ. Let's keep going. And, and, and he talks about, he said, if you do this, you prolong your life. Now, it's talking about prolonging life and it's dealing with, you know, the natural life. But it's a type and a shadow of prolonging your life for what? Eternity. All of these things speak to the reality of, uh, of, of the real uh, existence that we look forward to. We always have to remember that the spiritual realm is superior to the natural realm. Oftentimes today, we get it backwards. People are more concerned about their natural stuff than they are about their spiritual stuff. And it shouldn't be. It should be that you put spiritual things at a higher value than natural things. Jesus told us, seek the things which are above and not the things which are below. Speaking of heavenly things versus earthly things. And he, he told us, these earthly things rust, moth, eat them, and people come in and steal. But heavenly things are eternal. So it's a mind shift. It's a mind change. We have to shift our thinking and not be conformed to this world. Because this world will not reinforce that kind of thinking. This world will, will reinforce the thinking of, you better get everything now. It's all about here. It's all about what you got now. That's how our society our, our, and our, our, our whole structure of this world is set. So you have to go against the grain and continue to live in this world, but be spiritually mindful. And sometimes that becomes uh, a, 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 you know, an obstacle for individuals because we get all caught up in, in the fluff of this world, which is not very difficult to do. This world is very alluring if you allow it to entice you in all of its different ways of dragging you into all of the things that it tries to sell us and give us. But we still have to live here. Jesus, when he came as a baby, he lived here and he did the things that human beings have to do, but he also fulfilled everything that we're going to see here. Thank God for the Lord Jesus. 
Because if it wasn't for, for, for God, we would have no way to get to him. Because you cannot come to God in an imperfect form. That's why all the offerings and all of the, uh, uh, the rituals, whenever you did anything, you always had to bring a shadow aspect about Jesus. And it said bring an ox or a lamb or, or a goat or whatever, but it had to be what? Without spot and without blemish. That was a metaphorical aspect of it being perfect. That's the only way you can come to God. You have to be perfect. So we had that shadow aspect that gave temporary and, and ceremonially uh, aspe uh, 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 access to God for a time. But Jesus was the last offering. And he was the perfect offering. And he was the complete offering. All right? And so all of that brings us back into God's presence. We can now go to the throne of grace. How? Boldly. All right. Um, look at verse 3. It says, Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do. So look at this. About obedience. Look at all of this. Commandment. Keep the commandment. Keep the statutes. Make sure that you fear God. Uh, uh, keep all this stuff. Observe to do. You have to do these things properly, which we don't do. But Jesus did. So, so we see here that if you don't have Jesus, all of this is condemning us because we don't do it. And that's why Jesus told the Pharisees that he's not going to condemn them, but he said Moses would. Speaking about the teaching of Moses, these teachers of Moses will condemn them because they're not able to do these. All right. So let's go. Verse 3 again. It says, Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do, that it might be well with thee, and that ye might increase mightily. All right? So the scriptures talk about Jesus, how he grew and increased what? Mightily. All right? As the Lord God of uh, thy fathers have promised thee. This was a promise that was given all the way back to Abraham. Okay? In the land flowing with milk and honey. All right? That's what we are dealing with now. We're in that land that flows with milk and honey because why? We're in the presence of Jesus. We're in his, we're in his uh, 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 trust and, in, and, and we have brought him into our lives, into our hearts, and we're bringing him into our thinking. It's a, it's a twofold, well, I say two, but so let me just say it's a multifaceted aspect. When you bring him into your heart, you're saved. But now you got to bring, you got him in your heart and you know that you believe him, but now you got to hear his teaching his Jesus' teaching were not just words. They were for us to be able to, to take these so-called spiritual vitamins, these spiritual nutrients, and put them into our thinking, and it will edify us and strengthen us in this realm. This is the realm of milk and honey because that's what Jesus gives us. He gives us the things that will make us strong. Okay? And therefore, uh, and, 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 and we're, we're going to uh, move from that to eternity. But while we're here, we're still going to have some battles. We're still going to have some struggles. But we're not in Egypt, which you know, I'm getting ahead of myself. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But let's, let's keep reading. Verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, that's what he's letting you know. You only need to listen to the Father. What did Jesus say? Me and the Father are what? Are one. And he said, I didn't come to do my own will, but the will of what? My Father. Jesus was what? He was obedient. He kept the statutes. He, he uh, 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 kept all of the judgments. Jesus did it. Let's keep going. Verse 5. And ye shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. All right. Now, time for confession. Do you love the Lord your God? Okay, and the answer to that will be, yes, we do. Okay, and that's fine. But do you love him with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might? And we would like to believe. I, I would like to think I do, and I would say the same. I would like it, but I know I don't. Because there are a lot of things I do that come, that come out of selfishness. There are a lot of things I do that come out of fear. There are a lot of things I do that might come out of you know, and it's not that uh, I, I believe and trust in selfishness or fear. It's just that those are the imperfections. That's why I can't keep this. 
That's why I can't keep the Lord's word because these things crop up in me. They didn't crop up in Jesus. Jesus dealt with the anxiety. He dealt with the fear. He dealt with the abusive aspect. He dealt with the, the worry about conforming. He did all of that. Now, we all do some of this to some degree, you know, better and, 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 than, 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 you know, we may have done in the past or, or some people do it better than others or whatever the case may be. But nobody does it perfectly. Only Jesus did. That's why we need his righteousness to get to God. Because we got to be perfect. And if we're not perfect, if we try to get to heaven through some other kind of way, remember Jesus gave the parable, a parable about the man that was at the wedding garment, I mean, at, at the wedding festival. He knew he needed to be there, but he didn't have on the right what? Clothes. He didn't have on the wedding garment. In other words, that garment speaks of you, didn't, you weren't clothed in Jesus. You were clothed in, I believe God, I believe it, but you didn't accept Jesus' righteousness. And what happens if you're not clothed in the proper garment? He said, bind him hand and foot, and cast him out, where? Into outer darkness. All right? So, we got to put on Jesus, because if you think you've done this, if you're going to go sit up, I'm going to go sit up in the presence of God, because I've kept all this. You're going to get confronted. Why did you come in here with the wrong garment on? You don't have on the proper wedding garment. All right? So, let's get dressed properly. Let's put on Jesus. Put on the whole armor of God, which equates to Jesus. Okay? And that's an important aspect that we have to do. All right? So, uh, you got to love the Lord the God with all thy heart, thy mind, thy soul, uh, and thy might. All right? Which is important. Verse 6. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. All right? If those words are in your heart, you're going to always do them. Well, they're not always in your heart the way they should be. Why? Because we're sinful. See, the issue that we have to make sure that we agree with is that we were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. That means we're born in a sinful world, raised with sinful uh, 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 cultural aspects. Born in sin, shaped. We're born, that's our nature. Shape, that's our culture. All right? All of those things help to emphasize the sin aspect, the selfish aspect, the, 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 uh, um, the aspect of trying to be your own God, self-sufficient. All of those things are reinforced. We have to admit they're wrong. That's what you're confessing and saying, and, and I live in sin, confessing your, your, your wrongs, and then recognizing that the only right is God. And then God tells us that we have to come to his son. And his son says, you got to take my righteousness. And then we're now back in a place where we can get to God. And now while we're trying to get to God, we now also got to take on the teachings, the instructions that Jesus gave us to help us fight the battle. Right? You can, a lot of people can be saved, but you don't fight very well. There's a lot of people that love God and serve and, and, and have accepted Jesus as their savior. But they're not fighting well. They haven't put on the whole armor to be able to uh, fight against the wiles of the devil. So you're a, you're a good ser ser uh, servant of the Lord, but you're not a good soldier. Hmm. And so we got to make sure that we want to be a good servant as well as a good soldier. And then we can fight for the Lord as God gives us the strength. Nobody should be fighting on their own strength and on their, on their own power. All right? Look at verse 7. It says, And thou shalt teach them diligently uh, unto thy children. Teach what? The things of God. This is what they're telling Moses is telling these individuals here. You teach your children. Well, that's what Jesus has done. He's taught us, and he's taught us well. Now, the, Moses is teaching them, and Joshua will teach them, and, and, uh, but they're still going to fail. Why? Because they're born in sin. They're shaped in iniquity. And they're going to see all the stuff that these people are doing out in this land of Canaan, and they're going to want that stuff. Because, see, that's what culture does. You look at stuff, and you I want that. God told them, you should have me as your leader. They're going to see these other nations have kings. And God already knows it. And he says, when you get over there, you're going to want a king for yourself, just like how these heathen have a king, instead of you just trusting in me. 
But God's already knows and he's already prepared a way so that the king will, will come mm -hmm. and he's got an aspect about the king. But he knows they're going to do all of this stuff. But what we're going to do now is learn why they did it. Okay, so it's kind of uh, uh, interesting when you look at it. So teach your children, which the Lord Jesus did, uh, and uh, uh, thou shalt talk to them uh, when thou sittest in thy house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou gettest up. What is that saying? All day long. All day long. You got to have the word of God in you all day long. I have them when I'm going. I have them when I'm sitting. I have them when I lay down. I have them when I get up. I'm trusting God. All right. And what does that mean? I don't ever think that what I have done can produce righteousness. I'm always looking at the righteousness of Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. And whatever I'm going through, Lord, guide me, Lord. I know what I feel like I want to do. Tell me if this is according to your will. Help me to know whether I should continue. We're always putting these things before God. And you got to build that communication. That is your relationship. That's why this is personal. And that's why when it all comes down to things, don't let people tell you how to interact with God. People can tell you to go to God. I'm, a, I'm a, going to encourage you all day long, every day, 365 days a year. You need to go to God. But what I'm not going to tell you is what God's telling you what to do. That's not going to come out of my mouth. I'm going to tell you God's calling you. God is, is seeking you. And you should go to him. But now once you go to him, you then will find out that there are a lot of things that God's going to tell you that are very similar to what God tells everybody. All right? But he's also going to tell you some specific things for you. And that's an important thing to, to keep in mind. Um, when God was telling Peter that, that uh, Peter had, this is after the resurrection and Jesus had told Peter that, that you're going to go and you're going to be uh, 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 brought to places you didn't want to go before you went wherever you wanted to go but now you're going to be brought to places you really don't want to go and basically he was telling Peter that you were going to die uh, a martyr's death and then Peter turned to look at him well what about this guy he talked about John what about him and Jesus said look don't worry about, about him if I want him to live until I return what is that to you you do what I have commanded you. And so that's another aspect of sometimes that we sometimes overlook that little small verse of scripture that's important. That God wants us to all come to him, but then he will tell you that he might have something for you to do. Some of the stuff he has for you to do is going to not be fun. That's like we told P Peter. It's not going to be fun. And Paul had the same thing. Um, Paul was like, oh, I'm going to go to God. I'm going to get rid of this thing. And he went to God. And God said, no, I'm not going to take it from you. My grace is sufficient. I'm going to give you things that you didn't deserve, but I'm not going to take away the struggle. You're going to have that struggle. But I'm going to give you grace. And he said, my grace is sufficient for you. And then Paul said, I stopped praying for that. Why? Because he got direction. Right? And that's what we need. We need God to speak to us, give us direction. A lot of the direction comes from just reading his word. One of the things, that if you say, I want to know what God wants me to do, you should get into the Word. Read it. Other things, sometimes, God will give you revelation. That it's for you. And you can't take God's revelation and spill it and give it to other, anybody else. That revelation is for you and for you alone. For you to do. And that's an important aspect. That's why we have to come. And that's the whole aspect of Him teaching and, and, us, us and Him talking to His children. Like he's told, uh, Moses is telling these uh, uh, individuals that are going into the promised land, teach your children. Well, that's what God does. He teaches his children. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. So when God's speaking, we hear it. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. But we need to go to God all the time. Every day, all day, getting up, sleeping, going down to a rest, whatever. Go to God. All right? Verse 8. Um... And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and um, thou shalt be as frontlets before thy eyes. So what are you saying? Find ways to make sure that you're always thinking about the, the ways of God. 
right? So you gotta you gotta find ways to kind of convince and and encourage yourself. David said, I, I had to encourage myself. You gotta you're gonna have struggles where it forces you to think like our culture, but find ways to move away from the cultural thinking and think like how God has taught you. And has God taught you? Yes. Why? Because you are His child, and in this. Uh, teaching here, it says that we should teach our children. And you know that if that's the case, that Jesus has done that. He's giving us the teaching. And that's one of the reasons why before we started this scripture, started this, this chapter, I wanted to go and get some words from Jesus so that you can see he is in here and has done this. Alright, let's keep going. Verse 9. And thou shalt write them on the post of thy house and on thy gates. Same thing. Verse 8 and verse 9 all together. You know, you find ways of, you know, you write it down, give yourself little notes, little post-its here, little ways, you put little plaques on the wall, whatever it is. Whatever you got to do, you got to find a way to make sure that you are focused on what God is giving to you. Verse 10. And it shall be when the Lord thy God have brought thee into the land which he swore unto thy fathers. To Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give the great uh, and goodly cities which thou buildest not. Look at verse 11. Houses full with goods and things which thou uh, uh, fillest not, and wells dug which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shall have eaten of the of, of thy full then beware lest thou forget the lord which brought thee out of the land of egypt from the house of bondage now there's a lot in here what he's saying is number one he said this is a promise that i swore to your fathers and look at the phraseology. Remember, when we, when we started all the way back in Genesis, I told you, make sure that you pay attention to how names and different things are stated. And we pay attention to the cities and to the different things. So we know when we think about Egypt, we know that that refers to sin. When we think about uh, uh, um, uh, Bashan, we know we think about spiritual uh, wickedness and demonic influence. A lot of things that we kind of remember because, you know, Bashan was where the king of Og, who was one of those Nephilim uh, uh, individuals. So, same thing here. So, it says, Abraham, the father of faith, Isaac, remember Isaac was the one that foreshadowed the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, remember, because Abraham went to do what? To offer him. And then Jacob. Now, I always tell you, pay attention to Jacob, because sometimes Jacob's name is described in Scripture as what? Because he changed his name to what? To Israel. But he, called, he says here, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob represents that third aspect because Jacob is the trickster. Jacob is the problem. You know, he, he's just, and so it's letting you know that I'm, that, that it's going to bring you, you're going to believe in the father. You're going to trust in the son and you're going to uh, allow the spirit of God to work with you while you're in your mess. So when it talks about Jacob, it's talking about the spirit of God in us. And when it talks about Israel, it's talking about the spirit, spirit of God itself. Because Israel means uh, led by God or governed by God. And that's what the Spirit of God does. It helps to govern us. But when the Spirit of God is in us, in this realm, we're Jacob. We're led by the Spirit, but we're still tricksters. We're still confused in a lot of different things that we do. But God gives us light. And as we begin to see the light, we begin to walk. But then he says, I'm going to give you cities that you didn't build. I'm going to fill them with goods and food that you didn't have to fill it with. You're going to have wells that you didn't dig, vineyards that you didn't plant, olive trees, and, and, and all these things. What is that? When God gives you something that you didn't deserve, what is that called? Grace. Grace. This, these uh, several chapters here, all they speak about is when you go into this land, when you come into the place and when you begin to serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you will obtain grace. You're going to get stuff that you didn't deserve. You didn't have it. You didn't have to work for it. It was what? Given to you. And what does that speak also of? Righteousness. The greatest gift of God. He's going to give us something that we didn't have to 
earn or work for. And that, the greatest thing, is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We didn't have to work for that. We didn't have to go come halfway. We didn't have to, well, if, you know, if I do most of, if I just be a good person and then apply God's goodness, then my goodness plus his goodness equals righteousness. No. You broke the Sabbath because the Sabbath says you're not supposed to do what? Any work. So don't apply any work to the, per, to, to the fulfillment of the Sabbath, which is who? Jesus. Take your work out of it. Rest. And uh, just let Jesus give you all the, the righteousness that you need. You don't need any more righteousness than what he's given you. Because his righteousness is what? Perfect. Oftentimes, people say, well, you need Jesus, plus you got to do this, plus you got to do that, plus you got to do that. And all they're doing is adding work to the already completed work of Jesus Christ. They're breaking the Sabbath. And uh, that is, you know, when you go back and you look at Old Testament, one of the things about breaking the Sabbath was, it was, you say, well, if I went out and I collected some, some, some uh, olives or some grapes on the Sabbath, they would put me to death? Yeah, why? Because it shows you the type. If you try to do Jesus plus you, you will still die. You got to rest. So all this is grace. It's given to you. You didn't dig it. You didn't plant it. You didn't have to work for it. It was given to you. And we always got to keep that in mind. Look at verse 13. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and, and thou uh, swear by his name. So you're going to, what, you're, you're trusting God? You, you, you know, you're, you're living to uh, make sure that God is in your heart and you, re you reverence him properly. Yes, Penny? Um, I just wonder if we could go back to uh, verse 12 and bring that out a little bit because it says, Then beware lest thou forget the Lord. Because all this grace that he's given us, then that's the reason why we need to keep in front of us mm -hmm. the frontlets and the words of God and everything because we get so uh, elated and uh, absorbed with the grace that God has given us that we forget the Lord. That's right. That's a good point. All right, and it says, it says, uh, then beware lest thou forget the Lord. Well, that's why you got to have the what? Put the stuff out so you can continue to remember. He's the one that brought you out of what? Egypt. Well, Egypt is representative of what? It's always a type of what? Sin. He's the one that brought you out of sin. And then if, if you want to know, well, what does sin do? Well, look what it says. From the house of bondage. You were in jail. There's so many people are in jail in so many different ways. You think, well, I wonder how many people are incarcerated. Most of the world is in some kind of jail. And you need God to bring you out. That's why when we go through the books of, uh, of, of, of Acts, we see so many situations where the disciples were brought in jail, but what God uh, would bring an angel in and bring them out. That's symbolic and metaphorical aspects about us. We are all in jail, and God is bringing us out. Yes, sir. You know, it's funny. You know, like, um, you know, I, 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 I've been in rehab like three times. And uh, I've been in rehab with some really famous people. And the last rehab I was in, I was in with John Lucas. Hmm. And he told me, he says, you know what? He said, you know what bondage is? I said, no. It's being trapped in your own mind. Mm -hmm. yep. He said, being locked up right here. Yep. That's, you know? so true. That's so true. And he said, you know, when you unlock that, and you find this program, you'll see that this is nothing that you can do for yourself. Mm -hmm. He said, there's only one person that can get you clean. He's a nice guy. That's He's right. a nice guy. If you think it's anybody else, anything else, you'll never get clean. Mm -hmm. He said, there's no higher power. That chair, that table, that table can't do nothing for you. Mm -hmm. It's a toad your plate. Mm -hmm. He said, that chair can't do nothing but give you a seat. Mm -hmm. He said, it's not going to help you with your thoughts. It's not going to help you with anything. 
He said, there's the only person that can get you clean in this program. He said, that's God. That's right. He said, so, unlock your mind. Mm-hmm. You have to let him in. Right. And, you know, my sponsor over told me, says, you know, the program is a spiritual program. Mm-hmm. And until you see that, you'll never get clean. That's right. And he always said, the stuff you'll find in the Bible. He said, I can't tell you where. He says, but you go through scriptures and it gives this That's right. That's right. All of them, a lot of those things, uh, pretty much the majority of that is pulled right from Scripture. Yes. And it's important that we recognize it. It's a spiritual battle. Right? Mm-hmm. And if you don't see it as spiritual, um, then you will always have uh, failure with a lot of belief and hope that you can get to the next level, but you never get there. It's always a right. mirage. It's mm-hmm. always a, a trick. Yes. Um, sorry for taking up some time, but... Um, I I learned that I have to practice this every single day because worry comes, and for me I'm gonna just keep it on the eye. I go to the worry first, but then that's wrong. I need to go to God first mm-hmm. and put my worry in Him, mm-hmm. and I have to practice that every day when things come upon or, or you know, situations comes out, and then I'm. I'm calculating in my mind and then I have to chastise my mind and redirect my mind and just say God got it. Yeah. I trust uh-huh. God. That's, every yeah. day. And it, it's a battle. Every day every we have day. to do this because we were born in sin. That's right. That's right. It yes, is, that's why it says came to believe in the power greater than ourselves that can restore us to sin. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's, right. Oh. that's so true. Now, now look at verse 14. It says uh, ye shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are around about you. And therein is the problem. Mm-hmm. You're trying to find the answer in something else. Mm-hmm. I'm look- and, and a lot of times these, these something else can be uh, serve a purpose. Like Wayne's talking about the table. Well, that table is holding your plate. Oh, look at this table. It's holding my plate. Oh, this is a good table. But it can't save you. <laughs> the chair, oh, I'm relaxed. This chair makes me feel so comfortable. Oh man, I love this chair. It's got oh, it reclines and it's com- oh, it even got you know now these chairs got vibration and all that kind of stuff in it make you. But the chair can't save you. <laughs> and so you can apply that to anything else and all this different other entertainment power. Oh, the biggest thing, money. You know, oh, look at all the money that you can get if you do that. Money cannot save you. Jesus told us that. All right? And so it's important for us to keep in mind that we need Jesus. And if we can learn to put him first, as Penny said, before we put our, our, our own nature. But the problem is that is how we're made. We're made from sinful clay. But we have to try to m- modify and morph and change because that's where the joy of the Lord, you know, that joy that passes all understanding, the peace of God, that's where that will come from if we're able to to do that. Look at verse 15. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God. That means he's not going to allow you to be your own God. It's not going to work. He's not going to tell you, well, bring your God up here and sit him next to me. That's not going to happen. Okay? He's a jealous God. Uh, Lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee off the face of the earth. You're not going to have another God that's going to be put and and represented in the same facet as the God of of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's not going to happen. You're not going to be able to exalt anything to the height of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's not going to happen. Verse 6, 16 rather. Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as ye tempted him in Massa. Now, if you go back in Exodus chapter 17, you will see that's when they tempted him about how come we don't have any water. You brought us out of this land of Egypt and you brought us here and we're thirsty. And, and, and what they were doing was complaining about God. You're not taking care of us the way we want to be taken care of. Mm. And they complained and they tempted God. And so a lot of times people do that because a lot of times people are saying I don't really want to serve a God that won't give me what I want. My God, my God. So therefore, what are you serving then? 
You're serving your own appetite. And that's what Jesus told those 5,000. You didn't come to me because you, you saw the miracles and you see me as a spiritual blesser. You came to me because your bellies were full. And you just want the natural fulfillment. All right. Um, I think I can finish this up. Let me give it a try. All right. I might need five minutes extra. All right. So, um, uh, so we got to make sure that we don't tempt God. Don't, don't put things before. Well, God, if you, if you didn't give me money, I'm not going to serve you. Well, God, if you don't heal me, I'm not going to serve you. God, if you don't save my wife or save my husband, I'm not going to save you, serve you. Lord, if you don't save my, my children, then I'm going to, I'm going to serve. I'm going to find another God. You're tempting God and it's never going to work. Okay. Uh, 17. Ye shall diligently keep the commandment of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he hath commanded us. Diligently. Keep it all. Every little little nick and cranny of a, of a commandment, you better keep it. Well, sometimes we don't even understand it. But Jesus did. Verse 18. Thou shalt do that which is right and good. Wow. Do we miss, do we strike out a lot with that? In the sight of the Lord, that ye may be well with thee, and that ye might have go in and possess the land, the good land, which the Lord swear unto thy fathers. Okay? So this is how we experience that perfect relationship. We can't be perfect in our walk, but we can have that perfect relationship. I know God. I know Jesus, and I accept and listen to the Spirit of God. If Jesus is in your heart, and I'm believing the Word of, God, of, 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 of the Father, and I'm, in, I'm indwelled with the Spirit of God, God said, if I be in you, and you be in me, you shall then what? Ask what you will. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's keep going. Uh, verse 19. To cast out all thy enemies. Oh, See, this is an important part here. Because, see, we, we, we have to do this all the time. When they go into the land of milk and honey, they're not going to just sit down and relax. They're going to fight and cast out the enemy, which is what you got to do. They, and you're going to be casting out enemies left and right. But you know what other enemy you're going to be casting out? The enemy That's in is in you. The <laughs> enemy in me. The in me enemy. <laughs> That's the enemy you're going to learn and you have to be casting out. To cast out all enemies... From before thee, which the Lord hath spoken. Uh, verse 20. And when thy sons ask thee in time to come, saying, What meaneth these testimonies and these statutes and these judgments which the Lord our God have commanded you? Verse 21. Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen. We were in jail. We were slaves. In Egypt. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt, brought us out of mm. sin, with a mighty hand. Thank you, He Jesus. brought us out mm. because we couldn't get out ourselves. Yes, God yes. had to bring us out through miracles. And he did it by, by showing shame to all those false gods in Egypt. Each one of those, those plagues were uh, a direct uh, 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 arrow into the heart of each of those false gods. Mm. That they worship. All right, verse 22. And the Lord sh uh, showed signs and wonders, great and sore, upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household before our eyes. Now, God has done a whole lot of miracles before your eyes because you know how you were. Mm -hmm. You know how you were acting when you were living in Egypt. And all the stuff that was in your mind, all the heart's desires, all the wants and the yeah. cravings that you had, and how God came in and delivered you from those things. Now, you know about it. And some of those things, you don't want to tell nobody. But you thank God and you tell God, oh, oh Lord, I used to, mm, 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 Lord, I thank you. But now look at what God has done. He brought you out of the bondage that you were in. All right? And he did this before your eyes. You saw it. You know what God did for you. You can speak to it. Verse 23. And he brought us out from thence, and he that he might bring 
us in to give us the land which he swore unto his fathers. The Lord has given to us the things that he has sworn unto us. Come unto me and I will what? In no wise cast you out. Take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is saying, come unto me. And he told the Pharisees, you are, you, you're not going to come unto me that you might have life, which is a sad statement. But if we do come to him, we shall have eternal life. Verse 24. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord, our God. We should reverence God. He's all mighty. He's holy. And if you come to God and think you're going to get into his presence without the proper holiness, without the proper garment, without the righteousness of Christ, you are going to be cast out, bound out, and thrown into outer darkness. It's not going to happen that way. All right? So we got to fear him. It says, to fear the Lord our God for our, 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 our good for our good always. So we, God is, is going to work all this out for our good, what? Always. A lot of things might happen that seem evil, but God uses a lot of the evil mm -hmm. for our benefit. Always remember that. That he might preserve us alive. God has preserved you alive. When you preserve something, what do you do? You know, when you preserve food, you put it into these things, you got to boil it, get all the contamination out, and you do all this stuff, and you put it in the jar, and you seal it right. And what does that do? That, that doesn't, uh, with the preserving, doesn't allow any germs or bacteria to get into that preserved food to do what? To, to ruin it, to spoil it, to corrupt it. And that's what God has done for us. He's preserving us so none of that de demon or devilish or worldly or selfish or or fleshly stuff can get into our spirit and corrupt it. Now, our flesh, yeah, it, it, it's going to always, because our flesh is going back to the dust. So flesh can be harmed. It can be, it can be, uh, 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 you know, destroyed, and it will be decay. eventually. It can decay. You're going to get old and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's the flesh. But the spirit, your spirit has been preserved by the power of God. Mm -hmm. All right? Um, our final verse, verse 25. And it shall be our righteousness. That's, one, that's the verse we started with, right? All of this stuff is going to be our righteousness. Who is our righteousness? Who did this? Jesus yes. Christ. That's going to be our righteousness. This is our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. So, two ways. Be perfect, keep all the righteousness, and do everything that's in here, and you can present yourself to God. Well, you can't do that. So you got to have to find, has anybody ever done it? Yeah, all right? Jesus. Only Jesus Christ. So therefore, you got to go, well, you, you've done it. What are you going to do? He says, well, I've done it, and I've done it in such a way that I have it spilling over and running over, and I can give it to you. I can give it to the whole world. I can give it to anybody that comes into me. And that's what we accept. We accept the free gift of God, his righteousness. So then we can now go to God because our righteousness have to match the righteousness of God. And that's why Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, be ye holy even as your heavenly father is holy. Mm -hmm. What? Yeah. You got to be that. And then he told us, your righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. You can't do what they try to do. It has to be better than that. So you got to be perfect. And the only way you can be perfect is if you take on what Jesus is giving. And therefore, you then can have eternal life. And, uh, and, and, and these scriptures are going to continually reinforce that concept. All right, so we're going to stop there. I thank God for Beautiful. us Amen. getting through this.